Hi guys, it's Lockdown Joe and Lockdown Matt back with another uh, turbo dose for you. So um, we're going to talk about diabetic ketoacidosis today and we're going to be specifically focusing on D DKA because um, it's one of those common ones that comes up in simulation and it's a common presentation um, in acute medicine. So, so as always, what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll sort of run through a definition. We'll talk about some pathophysiology um, and before you run, roll your eyes, it's um, that that was something that Matt put in. No, um, it's just really important um, in in this specific presentation, uh, and, and we will go through some uh, management strategies. <laughs> about a definition so I'm going to do this first and then I'm going to get Matt to do the, the sort of more complicated stuff but in its definition there, there are three things going on that, that are helpfully highlighted unusually in medicine but helpfully highlighted actually by the title so there's a, a something that's diabetic something involving ketones and something that's involving an acidosis and so your diabetes or diabetic presentation is meaning that your sugar level your, your BM is above 11 from a um, ketotic element, a, a ketone element, your blood ketones are above three or you've got a ketonuria um, of above two. And finally, a, a sort of acidosis. So we, we commonly define that as a as a pH of, of less than 7.3 or, or a reduced bicarb, so, so less than 15. And then Matt, what is actually going on sort of underneath that veil? What's going on in terms of the pathophysiology here? As, as most patients know, type 1 diabetics have no insulin, so they, they, they lack insulin. Um, and essentially that leads to the release of glucagon from the liver. Because of the lack of insulin, the glucose cannot be uptaken by cells. So your serum glucose is high, even though your intracellular glucose is low. Um, and that causes two main problems. The first is that sort of starvation mode. As, as I said, you, your cells are intracellularly, they're, they're deplete of glucose. So your body has to use alternative fuel sources. As such, you burn essentially fat, which, which gives you these ketone bodies. And the other key thing with having that high serum glucose is you get an osmotic diuresis. So fluid is drawn from the intracellular compartment to the intravascular compartment, uh, meaning that you're intracellularly dry. And this gives the clinical features of polyuria and polydipsia. So going to the toilet more often because your intravascular space is being flooded with fluid, even though you're, you're actually very dry, your total body water is, is, is low. So Matt, apart from the, that, that classic triad that we learn about, the polyphagia, the polydipsia and the polyurea, what else are we going to be finding with these patients in terms of a presentation? It depends what stage they present at. So early DKA looks different to late DKA. In, 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 let's, in late DKA, you're generally going to be a little bit confused. So you're often a little bit hypotensive and you're, as a consequence, your, your conscious level is a bit low. I have seen patients very flat with you know, GCS is around the three mark from, from DKA. It is uncommon, but that's sort of a very late stage. Uh, uh, but mostly patients generally get abdominal pain, vomiting, and just feeling a bit off, feeling very tired, weak, lethargic, because as I said, they're going into that starvation mode. Early on, patients might just have a bit of a mild illness. There's, there's often a cause why they've gone into DKA. Something's destabilized them, and, and more often than not, it is an infection somewhere. And a lot of the time when patients, known diabetic patients, have an infection, they often stop taking their insulin because they're often unwell, so they're not eating as much as they think they need less insulin. They stop taking their insulin. Actually, that's that's the worst thing they can do. So, so diabetics who manage their condition a little bit better than others will still take certainly their long acting insulin because that's going to prevent them going into DKA. Um, whereas some more inexperienced diabetic patients will, will stop taking their insulin altogether, which obviously is going to cause more harm than good. So moving on to, to management then, what what are the key components, Joe? Um, I'm not sure, but I, th I think we should probably do an A2E assessment. A, a what, sorry? An A2E assessment. So it's a it's a primary survey. <laughs> so so obviously we, you start off um, uh, by doing a primary survey, looking for things that you want to immediately fix and immediately manage. As Matt says, you know, sometimes these patients can come in an extremist, but really the, the sort of hallmark for management of DKA comes in a few forms. So the first thing and usually the thing that sort of I'm used to providing from a pr um, primary care slash pre-hospital um, perspective is, is IV fluids. Checking the blood pressure, you're starting with a bolus and then actually you need to 
be a little bit more judicious and look at your local DKA guidelines. Obviously, the the concern with uh, repeat boluses providing a sort of raised ICP picture that you can if you give significant increases in in fluid. And so it's an initial bolus uh, based on the blood pressure and then um, titrating those fluids as according to your local guidelines. And, and then Matt, what, what, what other things do we go on to in terms of management from an in-hospital perspective? So it's the, the IV insulin is, is, is the key. We don't bolus insulin. So some, some practitioners still think we bolus insulin. Also some patients think we bolus insulin. So they may well give subcut insulin themselves prior to turning up to hospital. That often confuses the picture. So we give them a fixed rate insulin, normally weight based. So we go for 0.1 units per kilo. It's normally 50 units of that rapid in 50 mils of uh, saline as per local guidelines. Uh, I think the key with insulin as well is that you stop their short acting insulin, but you also need to give them their long acting insulin. So often their lantus, make sure they still get that at night alongside the, the fixed rate insulin. Kids are a little bit different. I don't think we'll go into to paediatrics, but look at the your local paediatric DKA guideline. Essentially, there's a much more thorough calculation of the percentage dehydration and the insulin is delayed by one to two hours after the start of IV fluids because of the risk of cerebral edema. And most hospitals advocate using that paediatric DKA guideline up to patients at the age of 25 because of the risk of cerebral edema. Um, and otherwise in hospital, as, as you move down, this is something that, that you're going to be treating for, for normally at least a day or so, normally a couple of days. Um, so you're having regular checks of, of your blood sugars, regular checks of your ketones and often repeat gases every one or two hours or so. Um, just keeping an eye out on those key key parameters. But the other thing that becomes complicated is obviously insulin drives glucose intracellularly, but also also drives potassium intracellularly. So you need to check the potassium regularly, hence why you're doing those regular blood gases. And again, you will have to add potassium into the bags, often alongside dextrose. So you, you get to a stage where you achieve normal glycemia. You don't want to drive them into having hypos. So your maintenance fluid becomes dextrose with potassium added to make sure that those those two things are corrected whilst you're still correcting the acidosis and the ketosis. If, if we're not responding well, Matt, then when do we start to think about referral up to more high intensity units or, or sort of ITU? Yeah, so the, there's sort of some key markers for, for severity, which you want to get your ICU guys involved with. Those include sort of a severe acidosis, so a pH of less than seven um, or a bicarb of less than five. Blood ketones over six um, is, is quite a bad indicator as well. Significant hypokalemia. So that's purely because you might need to replace potassium through a central line, which you can't do on a ward. Um, GCS less than 12 is, is something that's, that's often quoted. So a low GCS means you want to involve your ICU guys. Uh, and again, any sort of significant hypotension that might require vasopressor support or significant um, oxygen requirement, which is uncommon in DKA. Now, from, from experience, a lot of these, these patients, you, you see them first off and they'll have some of these severe features. So you call the you, you intensivist colleagues and they go, yeah, that's great. If you start the DK protocol, you go, yeah, I'm going to go good. I'll see them in two hours. And they're normally a bit better by two hours. Um, and so it's, the, it's those patients who either don't respond to the initial treatment as well as we'd liked, and you have to up their insulin, giving them, you know, you could go off the guideline, you go off protocol um, and giving them much higher doses of insulin than, than the guideline would suggest. Or it's, it's, it's those patients who are severely unwell at the start that the ICU will be interested in. Um, but the majority of DK will be managed on a medical ward and gets better quite quickly with the treatment. So the other reason that the intensivists might be interested in the patient with the low GCS is because of the risk of cerebral edema, which we've, we've mentioned a couple of times during this podcast. And we don't really know why that happens. The mechanism isn't fully understood, but it's believed to be due to, to sodium shifts as you uh, as you replace fluid. So as I mentioned at the start, because of the osmotic diuresis, you essentially have a diluted serum sodium. And that causes the extracellular osmolality to be high. Now, as you replace uh, fluid and replace insulin. You shift the glucose and water intracellularly, but you also change the sodium concentration and the osmolality as a consequence. So you actually have higher intracellular osmolality and a lower extracellular osmolality, which basically means water will preferentially move to the intracellular space. And that's what's believed to affect the, the brain as well and cause the cerebral edema. Uh, cerebral edema is more common in, in young patients. So that's why that we use the, the, the pediatric DK guideline essentially is a little bit more cautious with replacing of fluid and replacing of insulin uh, and it just takes a lot longer to, to recover and that's why 
most paediatric DKA guidelines include patients up to the age of 25 because it's those young patients who are at risk of cerebral edema that you want to be more cautious with. So that's just a brief jaunt through diabetic ketoacidosis. We've talked about the definition, we've talked about the pathophysiology, how these patients might present in terms of that classic triad of polydipsia, polyphagia, polyuria, and some of the other um, important, more subtle findings of your sort of abdominal pain, your vomiting, generally feeling unwell, right the way through to unconsciousness. We've talked about management in terms of IV fluids, IV insulin, and the investigations that you want to be undertaking. And we've talked about some of the referral criteria to higher dependency units or ITUs based on how the patient is is doing after an initial management strategy in your initial DKA protocol. Don't forget the uh, link between rapid fluid replacement and, and cerebral edema. And hopefully this information that we've condensed for you, you can utilize or develop those skills when managing a patient with DKA.